Um, Therefore, my brothers, whom I long for, um, I'm reading, yeah, the right one, cool. Um, Whom I long, love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm. I'm just going to read it off the screen because it's way bigger. Uh, Stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yudia, and I entreat, I can't, I tried. I can't get it. I feel bad when I try. So that name, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So these people are bickering, but we also know their names are in the book of life. So, yes, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, oh, that was easy. Let your reasonableness, that's a long word, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Ooh. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, or petition, depending on the version, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Two more verses, that's it. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Lastly, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Nine verses, right? I got nine verses to share. And I was like, man, I only got nine verses. And I read the nine verses. I'm like, whoa. These nine verses cover almost everything we deal, deal with in our day-to-day lives. <clears throat> I started, I, I read this, and I read it in our staff meeting when Pastor Ricky gives, gives us our sheets, like with our assignments and stuff. So I read this real quickly, and I was like, oh, cool, okay. And then I got home, and I was like, I read it again. I'm like, oh, whoa. And then I started reading it in different versions. I was like, Lisa, you got to hear how this version says this. It totally changes the whole picture. And I'm like, oh, man. So I got to read another version. And then I'm like, wow, if you look at this, God speaks to us how we need to hear it, right? So I, I have this other Bible that I got. Oh, man, when did I get this Bible? I don't know. It's the pages are folded. They have Kool-Aid stains on them, so it must have been college. Cuz I was poor, so I made a lot of Kool-Aid. Why don't we drink Kool-Aid? We're still poor. Anyway. <laughs> We're going to have a conversation after church today about the consumption of Kool-Aid in our house now. Uh but there's a lot of markings in this one. And what it is, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the message version, translation, um, but it's called the message remix. That means it was, for, it was written for us millennials that didn't want to hear everything the way everybody else was hearing everything, which is, I thought, why they had the message, but then we, needed to, we wanted to be needy, so they made us our own. Um, so in chapter 4, we're gonna, I'm going to just pull some of this out. 4 verses 4 through 5 says this, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you are on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive and he could show up at any minute. Don't fret or worry. Don't just be anxious. Don't fret or worry. Let's break this down to words we use and know. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness. Ooh, man. A sense of God's wholeness. Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. 
So I read that version while I was laying in bed one night, and I was, I was about to have church with myself. I was about to, like, have an altar next to my bed because I was like, God, I'm 30. I feel like I work every day, all day. Because also, if you don't know what I do, I'm also, like, I have a part-time job and a part-time job, and I'm self-employed. And I define self-employed as doesn't eat much um, or can't eat much. Uh, so I'm, I'm self-employed. So I spend most of my time working. So my wife and I have these conversations because we, we start to get tired because she works a lot too. She has a full-time job. We have three boys, six and under. Woo! And we're always going and we're always doing. So it's really easy in all of these stresses to become anxious, right? What is anxiousness? Does anybody know? Does anyone actually know the definition out, out of the dictionary of anxiousness? Anyone? See, now if I was teaching a young adult class right now, everyone would be on their phone trying to prove to me that they know. And they want to be right and have the answer. So I did that before I came up here and I Googled it. So, ha <laughs> ha, yeah. Anyway, so what is anxiety or anxiousness? Anxiety is distress or uneasiness of mind caused by fear or danger of misfortune. Hmm. Have any of you encountered that on a day-to-day level? Danger or fear of danger or misfortune. I'm going to be real. I'm pretty sure I have anxiety like every day at some instance. Like I drive a 97 Forerunner. The car is anxiety for me. Am I going to make it to work today? I have tires that look like donuts you bought at the street, of the street, okay? Like, I don't know if they're going to make it, but I have faith that they will. <laughs> I pray over my car every day before I drive down the road. I drive like four miles. I have faith, and I pray, God, do not let my tire blow out going around that corner down by Main Street where I will get squished by an 18-wheeler. I have fear of that. And you know what? So far, so good. I'm believing that my car will go until it needs to not go. I'm believing my tires will go until they explode. That's how I live my life. I don't know about you. <laughs> oh, it's a quick story. My grandmother, Miss Virginia, she's not here today, so I can tell this story. Her tires start to get a little bit low, worn. Time for new tires. I'm like, they still have tread on them. Like, there's still more than a quarter of a, a, a penny's depth on there. Like, why do you need new tires? I believe in donuts, and I believe in doing donuts in the rain. That's why I have donuts. I know how my e-brake works. It gets me around corners real quick, okay? Preach. Anyway, so, so far we've, we've, we've read in the Scripture that we're not supposed to be anxious, that we are... Uh, we're supposed to think on these things, but the first thing that they go over in this chapter is that there are two women who are upset with each other. Do you ever get upset with anyone? I'm going to ask a lot of questions, and all you have to do is this or this, okay? It just lets me know you're listening or pretending to listen. But there are two women that are, are bickering. They're not happy with each other. Th- something in the church happened that they didn't agree with regarding each other, and now they're bickering. And it was so important that at the beginning of this chapter, it gets pointed out. They get called out in order to resolve it. Sometimes, before we can deal with the things inside of us, like our own fears and our own anxieties, we have to deal with the things that connect us to others, too. If I have issue with my brother, what am I supposed to do? What? Go to him. Am I supposed to go to everyone else about the issue with my brother? No. That's what a lot of people do, though. I even find myself sometimes, you know, like, Lisa, Pastor Tim's being a jerk. He told me my shoes were not cool. 
and I need to stick to flip-flops. And I could go and I could tell that to everyone else instead of just, you know, hey, Pastor Tim, you said something about my shoes the other day. That wasn't cool, bro. And we're done. <laughs> and we're done. Instead of going to this person over here, they'll go to that person over there. Did you hear about Pastor Ty and Pastor Tim's feud? It's about his shoes. That's stupid. Like, I said stupid. My, my six-year-old's not around, right? Okay, cool. <laughs> like, we, we deal with things that way. Instead of going to the person that we have issue with, we go to everyone else, and then the whole church gets involved, and then everyone knows because everyone's gossiping, which is not biblical. We're not supposed to do that because that doesn't do anything regarding unity. The first few, cha- few lines in this book have nothing to do really about these women. It says it's talking about protecting unity in the church. So resolve your stuff in order to grow and build the house of God together. That's why they have to deal with their stuff. It's not just because these two weirdly named women have an issue. It's because it's hindering the church. So deal with your stuff. That's your number one today. So then we move down. And we get to the one that our, our, our whole series is about. It's rejoice. I'm going to be very honest with you guys. Like I see some of you sometimes. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit would hit you with like a joystick. Not like a good game controller, but like a stick made of joy. Because you can be, have, you have, we all have pretty good lives, Right? Our credit scores may suck. Our finances might be in like shambles, but we're breathing. We have the joy of the Lord that can live inside of us, and we've been given salvation. So I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot to complain about. I have bills just like you have bills. Stuff piles up in our lives, but that doesn't mean that we succumb to it and we start to let it rob us of the joy that God's given us. Instead, we take it to God with prayer, petitioning Him, not just so, because God already knows what's going on. He knows it. He knows everything going on in our lives because He's everywhere all the time. He sees everything. He knows everything. But He's also got all the power to deal with it. So when we bring it to Him, It's not just so, you know, hey, God, I know you know my problems. But it's so that we can, like, mentally say, I have this problem, and I'm giving it to you. When was the last time you actually gave God something? I don't know, like, I think about this sometimes when people say, yeah, I had this affliction, I had this thing, and I just gave it to God. But then I hear him talking about it all the time. I hear him complaining about it all the time. I hear him just reveling in it all the time. And I'm like, if you give somebody something, you let it go. If I give a, ki- a, a Christmas gift to my child, I don't hold on to it with one hand and say, okay, I give you this gift. Take it. Fix it. Play with it. No. When I give my child a gift, I give it to them. And I expect them to do with it what they will in their will, in their way. When I give something to God, I say, look, I take my hands off of it because I can't do diddly squat about it. So here it is, God. Change it. Or let it be the thorn in my side that I have to learn to deal with. Because every bad thing that happens in your life, doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't go away. It doesn't have to go away. Sometimes that goes to our testimony. Like Pastor Tim last week, he had me crying on the front row. It was not fair. God, there's something in his life that whether it goes away or he's healed of it, both of them impact his testimony. Both of them bring glory to God if he allows that. Both of them. It's our perspective and our attitude. So, we're going to jump on this one that with young adults, with 30-somethings, with teenagers, with kids with adults, senior adults, we all experience. 
is this word anxiousness. Anxiousness, we've already covered as fear, right? Right? Yeah, it is. And God has not given me a spirit of... Ooh, he hasn't given me a spirit of fear. Instead, he's given me a power, love, and a sound mind. So we have to choose. It's on us to choose. Do I live in the fear, or do I live in power, love, and a sound mind? If I have a sound mind, I'm not worried about the possible misfortune that could come my way or the danger or the things that would, you know, come against me. So anxiousness is that, you know, fear of misfortune or danger. But fear is a distress, distressing emotion aroused by impeding danger, evil, pain, etc., whether the threat is real or imagined. The feeling or condition of being afraid. A specific instance of propensity for such a feeling and anxiety. I get really annoyed with the dictionary when they use one word that I'm looking up to define the other word and then vice versa. But in this instance, anxiety is fear and fear is an anxiety. And we're not supposed to have that. The thing that I encounter almost daily is something that I have to die to daily. I have to say, no. I could be anxious whenever all my bills are get paid, and I'm like, well, how are we going to eat today? I could freak out. I'll be very honest. Sometimes when that's happened, I do freak out. Because I'm like, man, I should have gone grocery shopping first, then paid the bills. But it's every instance that I go, okay, you know what? I don't know how this is going to work, but God, you got this. And then my grandma's like, she shows up at my door the other day. It's like, hey, I was at the farmer's market. Here's a bag of food. I'm like, I love corn. I love ears of corn, Grandma. Thank you. And in that moment, I was like, God, you're looking out for me. Because he takes care of us. If we don't have the negative things in our lives that we're supposed to abandon and lay aside and we cling to the things that are good and holy and that are of Him, then we believe those things and we apply those things. He takes care of us. That's how He works. So, I'm just going to give you a heads up. We're a third of the way through in the notes. Just so you know, if you're keeping track. Ah, uh, it's fun when you make yourself laugh at your like while you're preaching. It's fun. Um, all right. So there's a word in here. Um, he talks about peace with anxiety. Man, I wrote way too many notes. I should have just like done the thing that the youth told me to do and wing it. Anyway, in four seventy uses the word peace. And I had to look this up. Um the Greek word is Irene, which I had to listen to 20 times in Pastor Tim's office before service to get that right, and I still think I messed it up. Um, but it has, the, it has several meanings. This word peace, it includes well-being, prosperity, freedom from anxiety, safety from harm, and deliverance from your enemies. That word that he used, meaning peace, he used intentionally. And if we read Scripture for what it is, and we study Scripture to look at the words that were used originally, they were used with meaning. Sometimes, and I listen to a lot of podcasts and sermons, and I listen to a lot of preachers that I really don't think they give any thought to the words that you, they use before they use them. We, we use terminology, and we use... Um, Christianese, it's my favorite language, it's ever evolving. Um, we use terms so easily without even thinking about the power of our words, about what they mean. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, um, having thought out what I'm going to say, and this ties into the, the remainder of the message, Pertaining to fear, anxiety, everything that you encounter in life, 
God wants you to encounter these things. Because the things that you come against and the things that you encounter are forces of movement. If I hit, uh, have you ever driven bumper cars? I love bumper cars because I'm a heavy guy and, and I don't bump much. Like, people hit me and I'm like, staying still. They're moving. I love bumper cars. Bumper boats are better. Anyway, but I like this because of bumper cars and bumper boats. Everything we encounter in our life is like the other drivers in bumper cars. Comes against us to see how far it can shift us. Comes against us to see if it can knock us around. But that's life. That's how we live. The, the way I used to play bumper cars when I would go with my dad when I was little was I would get really angry when people would bump me. Because I wanted to be the bumper. But I couldn't figure out which pedal made me go. True story. Got agitated a lot. But I realized as I got over that when I get bumped, I can either let it agitate me or I can wait for it and find the joy in the moment. Because there's something really funny about getting slammed around by a bunch of little cars on like hover things. It's, it's, it's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to cause anxiousness, fear, frustration, anger, malice towards the person that's bumping you, which was oftentimes my dad. He targeted me, realizing that now. We're going to talk later. Anyway, <laughs> but instead of finding all those things and getting mad about it, which it translates to most of the situations in my life, I could get mad about it, or I can see what happens when I get bumped and see where God's trying to take me and see what he wants me to experience. Because I can look at it through my eyes or I can look at it through my father's eyes. And what are you trying to teach me in this? Oh, man, my car broke down. I can get mad. Or I can be like, <laughs> my car broke down. Oh, boy, that stinks. Hey, honey, we're going to go look at other cars <laughs> and not buy a one. <laughs> right? Last night we went on a, a date. We went to Dairy Queen. Woo! And then I surprised her by going to look at used vehicles. It's like, ooh, date. It's like, so you're going to trade this one in for that? No. I just wanted to look. That's how we all live my life. It's like, I could do these things, but buying a new truck would bring me happiness for a few days. And then I would realize that it has the same problems that every other car does on the road. It's made to fail. Many things in our life are made to fail. And those are the things that test our patience and our response. Those are the things that bump us. But how do we respond? With anxiety, fear, frustration, anger? Or do we just roll with it and see where it takes us? I love Pastor Tim. I pick on him. Like I told him this morning, he was praying for me, and his, his hand was shaking. I said, you'd be a great masseuse at this point. It's great. And I love my brother because we can make those jokes, but at the same time, I love him so much because I can't wait to see what God does with him at this point. It's like, man, just to use a term I use with the young adults a lot, crap happens, okay? Oh, we're Facebook live, and man. Hi, Grandma. Stuff happens. It happens to us. In this, these verses, we see that stuff happens. But instead of thinking on the negative, we think on the good things. And then the negative things, <laughs> it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter one bit. So, how often did we see... Anxiety and anxiousness and fear brought up in Scripture. A few times, actually. Um, real quick, I'm going to give you a, a side note. This is your free, a second freebie of the day. 4-6, uh, chapter 4, 4-6. Four, the one essential cure for worry is prayer. Prayer. 
Who'd have thunk that the cure for everything that ails you is communicating with God? I think a lot of us did. I think a lot of us have forgotten that, you know, if something's wrong in my life, I can gripe about it. I can tell everyone in my social circles and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, pretty much everywhere. I can gripe about it to everyone and let them all know how everything is awful in my life. Or I can just say, hey, God, this is messed up. Can you take care of it and bring it before him? Because in reality, the people around you can do very little about your problems. The creator of the universe can take care of everything. If we can have faith like a mustard seed that can move a mountain, you know where that power comes from? God. I can have faith like a mustard seed in Facebook, and it's going nowhere. Not a one thing can be done. I can have other people complain about it with me. You know, it's nice to have people in your boat, right? Unless it's sinking. We, uh, my job is social media every day. I do it. I help with our church. I'm the social media guy for the First Baptist Church. That's what I do. I consult with people on how to better use social media. And lately, I've been feeling really guilty about my job. Because I'm trying to get people to convey who they are and how good they look when they don't really do that. We convey a lot of messages that we aren't really who we are. We convey a lot of messages that aren't, don't really convey what we believe. I think that if we took the time on our social media to be transparent and real, I think it might actually change social media. If you use social media for a tool for ministry, not like, hey, we're going to post a scripture picture of the day, but like testify of what Jesus is doing in your life. Like, oh my goodness, my leg was broke, y'all, and now I can walk. Man, I would love to read that 20,000 times. Not, uh, like, I love you guys. I love people. But I'm so tired of bickering and frustration on social media. I'm just, I'm just venting for a second. Y'all can take it. You can make me run in my sneakers after church. That's fine. But that's not, we have resources that where we can speak into people's lives all over the world all over the world. People can look you up because you don't know how to turn your privacy settings off. And they can see what you're posting. And what are you conveying to the people who have no idea who your God is and what you believe in? Just a thought. So, Matthew chapter 6 and Luke 12, they say the same thing. Well, most of the Gospels say a lot of the same stuff. So I'm going to read you Matthew chapter 6 real quick. It says, in my Bible, it says, the title is, Do Not Be Anxious. How profound. Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value or, or are you not of more value than they? Verse 27 says, "And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life?" <coughs> Have you figured out how to do that yet? I haven't. 28. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But, 
I love that word in the Bible. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And then down here um, in Luke uh, chapter 12, 32, it adds, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief that approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. I read all these verses. I was working on this. I've been working on this for a while, but I got really heavy into it Friday and Saturday. And I read these verses, and I'm like, God, I feel like those are the three things that I'm always dealing with or struggling with or hearing about. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? How am I going to make it? And it says, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added to you. It's really simple, right? In my head, it's really simple. If I don't do this and I focus on this, it'll be taken care of. But is it that easy? No. My wife's a therapist. I know it's not that easy. We had this long on our date last night. We talked about this. He said in our, our, in our brain, we have these responses, right? What was it? Fight, flight, or freeze, right? When we encounter things, when things happen to us, we either fight it, we run from it, or now they add another one, we freeze. We just get stuck in it and wait till it passes. That's how we do with, deal with things in our lives, right? I don't know. Um, maybe not you, but I do. I either fight it, I get mad at it, I come against it, I run away from it because it scares me, or I just let it happen and, you know, it'll pass eventually. But when I think about this in my, my, my physical life, like I, I see the instances where I do that. And then I think about it in my spiritual life. Do I fight? Do I take flight? Or do I freeze? I'm going to be real honest with you. I probably should fight more. Freeze and run less. I should probably come against the things that are thrown at me by the enemy more instead of just, you know, okay, well, it's just going to happen, so let it happen. Or just run away from it. Because if I truly embrace the fact that I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, the same power that was in Jesus, when you accept Jesus, it's in you. Whoa! Yes. The power that comes inside of you when a lady grabs your jacket. If you are living in that much faith, and you believe what he said, and you walk it out, and you live it out. If a woman that's dealing with an issue of blood comes up, it shouldn't have just been Jesus that could have touched her. It could have been any of the disciples. It should have been. Everyone we encounter, if they have an issue and they come to us, and they're like, can you pray for me? We should live out faith so greatly that in that moment, if it's God's will, it's done. It's not this, it doesn't always have to be this prolonged battle. You know why we have such prolonged battles? Because we have so little faith. That's what happens. We forgot to pray. We forgot to give it to God and let it go. And we forgot to take the steps of faith that where He leads us. Because remember, we're not walking in ourselves. When we walk in ourselves, we can't do jack. But when we walk where he wants us to walk, when we talk like he tells us to talk, when we think like he wants us to think, then we're living like Jesus. Then I don't have to be anxious. I don't. Because I know that he's going to take me where he wants me. 
I know that he's going to do with me what he wants to do. And I have no fear with that. That doesn't sound scary. That sounds like a really cool ride that I want to go on. I'll be, I'll be very honest with you, though. When I've got sin in my life that I haven't dealt with, when I've got sin that, is, that I'm letting overpower me, that's making me question everything in my life, so I'm insecure and I don't think I can do anything for Jesus, that's when I feel beaten. That's when I feel like I can't do anything. But when I take it and I say, here, forgive me for ever letting that overcome me. And I say, God, take it. It's almost like we sing that Break Every Chain song. That's what it's about. In that moment, when you give it away, that weight is not on you anymore. In that moment where you say, God, take the sin out of my life. Let me turn to you and go after you. It is a narrow path. We've, we've talked about this. But when your eyes are fixed on the cross, you don't have to worry about where your feet are going. I don't want to worry about the things that come against me in my life. I want to know that they're taken care of. And you know what that requires? Man, I didn't even get through like most of this, but that's okay. It requires faith. Because faith, believing in the prayers that you're praying, you overcome the things that are come against you. So I'm going to talk about four things real quick. Four things real quick. Number one, this, this is going to be primarily about anxiety. I just realized that. Anxiety in your finances. Whoever has anxiety in your finances, like for real, show me your hand. Come on, be brave. There you go. My hand's up too. Anxiety in your finances. We see repeatedly that we're not supposed to worry about these things. Yet this is one of the daily things that comes against us because we're so focused on what's in my hand. Pastor Tim tells us all the time that if we live our lives with a clenched fist holding on to what we have, then God won't do anything with it. But when we have faith that God will take it and not just put it where it needs to go, but bring it back in and take care of us, when we live our lives saying, God, here's my finances, like legit, like here's my finances. I want to be a good steward of it I'm going to be very honest. This is like my weak point, so it's fun to preach right now. Like, I want to be a good steward of it. I want, to, I want to do with it what you want me to do with it. But that means I have to surrender it to you just like everything else. When we do that, we stop freaking out about it as much. Number two, second area. These were the four areas that, like, in talking to people and counseling people, And and just praying for people. These are the four areas where we see a lot of anxiousness and fear. Number two, your marriage. Marriage? Yeah. Whenever I first got married to Lisa, I was very insecure. Like, we would would say, okay, this is how our day is going to look. And if there was any deviation from that, I got stressed out. It's like, whoa. You did not say we were going to your parents today. Whoa. I don't know if I can handle that. I can. I love your parents. But at that point in my life, I was so insecure in myself that those were the things that made me anxious. Finances, oh, man. At that point in my life, if something bad happened, my day was over. I'm like, oh, I can't handle this. And it led me to this other point where if things came against me that I didn't know how to handle, I also didn't know how to communicate that with her. So my fears and my, my anxieties, I took, kept them to myself. And when you do that in a marriage, it starts to build that wall that divides you. It starts to, the communication, and oh no, we are not perfect at all, but we try because we want to be a godly representation of marriage. But one of the things that I love about my wife is that when I have a hard day or when something just really dumb happens, I know that I can talk about that with her. And even after nine years, we're still working on that because I still have insecurities. So I'm not always going to be like, 
well, here's all the bad stuff that happened today. There are still things that, like, when they hit me, I'm like, I just want to take care of that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to share it because of my anxiety and my fear. But in reality, when I share those things with my wife, she feels so much more secure in our relationship than when I try to hide things and keep them by myself. So, anxiety and fear in marriage. Here's one. This is a fun one. Anxiety in your parenting. <laughs> parenting. Anxiety in how to discipline your children. Should I spank my kids? Should I ground my three-year-old? No! They don't know what that means! You're grounded from TV. Well, I'll go play with blocks. whoop de doo God put us over our kids. Like, no, no, no. Oh, you need to listen to that. God put us over our kids. He did not put us level with our kids. He did not put us under our kids. We are above our kids. I am the priest of my household. That means I'm the top dog. And I have to deal with them because I'm responsible for them. Do we have... Oh, man. I encounter so many people, not people here, out in the world, and she does more than I do because she is a child therapist in our public schools. There are some people I want to smack just being real. Because I'm like, you have the greatest potential to speak into a life and you're squandering it. I find great joy, stress, and honor in being a father. Because that means that I have freebies, three. I have three freebies that I can point to Jesus. I don't have to go out and find them. They're already in my house. It's like, woo. But anyway, I have three little lives that I can shape and mold to be like Christ. And boy, is it hard. Especially that middle one. I don't know why. <clears throat> he, is, he is awesome. But he is fiery. And he's going to let you know it when he punches you. Anyway, he'll bring you to your knees real quick. Anyway, he is a great little kid. And I love my boys, but I know that I am over them. And their mom is over them. Because one thing that we forget, I don't know, I forgot it for a while when we first had kids, but, but my priorities are supposed to be God, then my wife, then my children. Because those little pipsqueaks, they came after her, not before her. She was there first. So if I forfeit my wife for the betterment of my children, what kind of father am I? My wife is my treasure and my jewel. My children, they're the arrows in my quiver. I'm going to send them out. I just got excited. I don't know why. <laughs> Woo! Anyway, did you feel that when I left? Like, for real, Mom. <laughs> Woo! Woo, I'm going to cry. Like, I joy. I don't know. They're only six, like six, two, and one. And I'm like, all right, 12 years, peace. <laughs> I love my kids. <laughs> but that means that I have 12 years for my oldest son to take everything that I know and I understand and then surround him by people that love Jesus as much as I do, more than I do, and that live it out so that he can see the right way. And that is my joy and honor. And our society and our world forgets that that's what our job as parents is. It's not just to feed them, because believe me, my kids eat a lot. That one-year-old is five pounds less than the two-year-old. He's trying to catch up really hard. He wants to eat everything. Like, he will sit in a chair for 20 minutes eating a sandwich. Not one sandwich. Three sandwiches later. 20 minutes. 
roughly. Anyway, he'll eat. But my job is not just to feed them. It's not just to bring money into the house so they can buy all those stupid little toys that hurt your feet when you're walking through the house at night. It's not just to buy them cable so they can watch shows that I don't even know what they're watching. Like, I do know what they're watching, but I don't know aliens and stuff. But anyway, it's not just that. It's much more than that. My job is to be the priest that points my children towards Christ. Is there anxiety in that? Yes. But there doesn't need to be. Because if I'm pursuing Christ and I'm doing what He wants me to do, then He will also take care of that. Because He's the protector of my children, not me. Sometimes in my protection, I get in the way of what He wants to do. I'm supposed to guard them. But if God says, get out of the way so I can do this, I'm supposed to be obedient and get out of the way. Number three. Oh, and one more thing. Yes, I do spank my children. Tate. And Sam gets a little pop on the leg because he don't really care. Um, but I will say this. I, I was spanked as a kid, and I like to think it worked. You be the judge of that, not me, anyway. Uh, but I do spank my kid because I believe in that verse where they talk about spare the rod, spoil the child. And you can get really deep on that and a study on that. That's great. Good for you. Go read some more. Um, but I like to also take some things at face value sometimes. And I know that as a child, if I was not disciplined, I would not be standing here right now. I know that if my mom and dad didn't love me enough to occasionally, you know, Here's the size 46 belt or whatever. My dad's a big guy. It went all the way across my backside. Anyway, if they didn't love me enough to discipline me, I probably would have made much worse decisions in my life. And that's part of parenting. Having the courage to discipline when discipline is required. Time out works. Tate, he doesn't really care about time out anymore. He does care if you take the TV away, and he does care if he gets a spanking. Because he understands what shame is. Sam has no idea what shame is. He's like, Sam, do you want a spanking? Yep. For real, in the bathtub the other day. And I was like, I don't even know what to do right now. Do you want a spanking? Yep. I asked him three times, do you know what a spanking is? Yes. You want a spanking? Yes. And I was just like, <laughs> you're the child therapist. Something's wrong. <laughs> and then I realized I was the child that says, Mom, that doesn't hurt anymore. You need to go get Dad. I was dumb, y'all. Like, you don't even know. She knows. She was there. Lastly, and this is the, uh, the kicker, and I'm done. We have anxiousness in our pursuit of Christ. But not just in our pursuit of Christ, but in the, the showing of who Christ is in our lives. I'm going to say something, and this is why I wear the tennis shoes, because um, I see people argue about it online. Um, God didn't create us to be comfortable people. God didn't create us to just stay in one place in life. We see that with the children of Israel because an 11-day walk took 40 years. He made them move a lot for us. And, and, and I've come to realize this a lot more lately. Um, when I went to youth camp, God asked me to do something. I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to say no, but I'm going to ask you a few times to make sure you're, you, this is what you want. And uh, he showed me at youth camp that uh, I'm not supposed to be comfortable. Actually, I'm supposed to be insanely uncomfortable because if I get stuck where I am, I might stop looking at him. But if I'm so uncomfortable with the way things are around me in the world, and if I'm so uncomfortable living in my, my fleshly life, then and if I'm so uncomfortable and just sitting in that seat, I'm going to tell you something. The, the people that you sh 
buy your groceries from, the people that change your oil, the people that you bank with, and know they know your name because it's on the check. They should know so much more about you than that chair that your butt's been sitting in for 10 years. It knows what kind of jeans you wear. It knows what size waistline you have. But the people that are out there in the world should know so much more than that. I should be so insanely uncomfortable that this chair should rarely see me. Or that chair. Actually, now I sit over there. This is Pastor Ricky's seat. I don't sit there. This chair should rarely see me, even when I'm in this house, because I should be talking to you. I should be seeing how you're doing. I should be building relationships with you. And I should be so uncomfortable because, to be really honest with you guys, after about 20 minutes of talking to people, 30 minutes, I usually want to go do something else. Like sit down and be alone. But that's comfort. Bailey, are we supposed to be comfortable? No. Why? If we stay in our comfort zone, then we won't go out and tell more people about the Word of God. Yeah, exactly. I like to think of it this way. Um, I'm one of those people that, that I never really have dreams, um, or I don't re- you ha- usually have a lot of dreams, but when God really wants to tell me something, He'll give it to me in a dream, and it freaks me out. But, um, like, for real, like, freaks me out. Um, but I had a dream a long time ago, and in this dream was a pond. It was a beautiful pond, lily pads, frogs, beautiful flowers, all that great stuff. And it was the church. It was supposed to be the church. And I was like, okay, first night, I get this beautiful pond. Like, I want to go there and, like, set my hammock up and stay. And then the next night, I had the same dream. And the water source was cut off. It wasn't a pond anymore. Or it wasn't like a stream with, like, a water source feeding it. It wasn't fresh water. It became just this stagnant body of water and then the next night I had two dreams this was years ago first option in a season of dryness that body of water disappears and has is no longer a source of life for the habitat around it now remember this dream was about the church so we could dry up the other option was this you still have a little bit of water that comes in, but the water moves so little that it becomes stagnant. And then the bugs come, and the moss grows, and the algae grows, and it becomes from a pond to a swamp. What was once beautiful has become a place of life, but not positive life. And I was like, okay, God, what does this mean? And it was quite simple, and it was a night of prayer that we had in Hendersonville. This was like 10 years ago. And I finally got it. And the point was that if you stay, if you once know the living water and allow it to fill up your house, your pond, and then all of a sudden you start doing things the way you want them done, you start caring about the aesthetics, you start caring about the, the, you know, the things that are really trivial, then you'll either dry up and become useless or you'll become a place of stagnant nastiness. And the more I look at the church of today, not our church, we're a good church, right? But the more I look at the world and their viewpoint of the church, I see them as seeing us as the latter. Where the things that were once good have become things of nastiness or a swamp I don't want that I want to be a part of a church that is connected to the life stream where the river of living water flows through this house where life can come and grow without fear without anxiety without worry those things have no place in our lives If you go back home and read this later, 
It gives you a thing, a list of things to think on. And what's beautiful is, in these various translations, they use different words. And I like to go on my phone and I make notes of, this is what I'm going to do in the day. So yesterday, I went on my phone and I made a list of my reminders that happens daily. And it tells me to think on these things. So my challenge to you is think on those things. Don't be happy with sitting in your situation of gloom and despair, fear and anxiety. Actually, get so uncomfortable with it that you just turn it over to God and say, God, take it away from me so I can do what you want me to do. I told, I was in here hanging out with the youth on uh, Wednesday night, and we talked about some numbers for teenagers in Portland. <coughs> Between the middle school and the high school, there's about 2,400 students. About 6% of those on a good day are attached to a church. That's not a lot. How many people are in Portland? Anybody know? Was it 12,000? 12,000 people. If there's 6% or less of teenagers attached to a church, how many adults do you think are attached to a church? And not for the sake of, you know, having the biggest church in town, but for the sake of building the kingdom, what are we doing about it? Well, there's some seats, and there's some seats, and there's some seats. Your chair at church shouldn't be your best friend when it comes to Jesus. It should be the people outside. I told the teenagers and the young adults, one of the things I want to do is not just talk about Jesus while I'm here, but while I'm out there. I want to share Jesus. Because that's what we're supposed to do. Right, Joe? Yep. Not keep him to ourselves. So get uncomfortable. Hey, Michelle, would you come play the piano? Cool. I made her uncomfortable. I made her stand up. We always talk about altar call as um, this this thing that you do if you have, you know, real problems. But in the Old Testament, um, they they came to the altar, yes, when they had issues, but they also brought good things to the altar. They had times of year that they came to the altar out of tradition. But the altar was not a foreign place to them. It was a place where they came because they knew they encountered God there. So today's altar call is not just a, hey, if you got this in your life, this in your life, this in your life, then I want you to come down. when, When I talk about altar time, I talk about making a step out of the place where you're sitting and you're comfortable to take a step to move towards God. Yes, God is where you're sitting. But when you stand up and you do something and you have a movement that goes along with it, up here, it's not just, okay, I'm going to sit here in this chair and talk to God. Because I can talk to God right here. Y'all can't see me back there anymore. It's okay. I hope my hair's okay. But I'm not just sitting in this chair, but when I, I have to think about standing up. And then I have to think about coming down and encountering God. Sometimes that's the hardest part for you. And how can you even expect to do anything out there if you can't even get over that part? The one time you experience Jesus when you get saved shouldn't be the only time you come and talk to Him. This place, the reason it exists, why there's awkward steps here, is so we can dedicate a place to coming before Him. So what these are for. They're not just steps. They're places to kneel, to come before the King, to submit the offering. So yeah, we're going to pray about some things. So bow your head for me for a second.